Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Lincoln on this Sunday morning. My name is the Reverend Oscar Sinclair. Each week since the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic in March of 2020, our congregation has gathered together at least twice. On Thursday night, when we tend to our community and each other directly on Zoom, and on this service, on Sunday morning broadcast on YouTube. Sunday morning, whether in person or on YouTube, is a chance to proclaim who we are and what we are about, throwing open the doors of the congregation and proclaiming the radical love and welcome that is at the heart of our shared faith. The Unitarian Church of Lincoln, we say, aspires to be a loving community, uniting reason with spiritual exploration to transform ourselves and the world. And right now, this fall, in this year when so much is uncertain, we know that transformation is necessary. This is the place. This is the time. Who will we be? How will we be? In a time of anxiety and pandemic and fear, what are we called to be as a community? This is, as Reverend Susan Frederick Gray puts it, no time for a casual faith. And this right here, right now, is where we practice. And as Susan Frederick Gray puts it, this is no time to go it alone. And so this right here, right now, is where we practice together. So take a moment as we begin. Be present right here, right now. Let go of what you've carried here. Set aside what will come later. Just be right here together. There is work to be done. Let's be about it. We light our chalice this morning with words of the poet Adrian Rich. My heart is moved by all I cannot save. So much has been destroyed. I have to cast my lot with those who, age after age, perversely, with no extraordinary power, reconstitute the world. Welcome to worship. Our story today is called I Am One by Susan Verde with art by Peter Reynolds. How do I make a difference? Seems like a tall order for one so small, but beautiful things start with just one. One seed to start a garden, one stroke to start a masterpiece, one note to start a melody, one step to start a journey, one brick to start breaking down walls. And I can speak one gentle word to start a conversation. I can use my one soft voice to start a friendship, I can perform one act of kindness to start a connection. I can share one tender hug to start caring. I can light one candle to start leading the way. I can make one drop in the water to start ripples that become swells and then waves traveling over oceans, across borders and boundaries, landing on distant shores to start a chain reaction inspire a movement, make a change. I am one and I can take action. We are each one and we can take action. One by one, we can make a difference because one is all it takes to start something beautiful. Sometimes it can feel like there are so many issues facing the world these days that we wonder how, as one individual, we can make a difference. This book was inspired by a quote from the Dalai Lama, just as ripples spread out when a single pebble is dropped into water, the actions of an individual have far reaching effects. Indeed, incredible things can begin with just one. Just as a beautiful garden starts with one seed, all of the marches and collective movements we witness and participate in started with one idea, one step, 
one voice, one act of kindness, and we can take our own first step to make the world a better, more united, and more beautiful place. We are all activists. So how do we begin? The following is a mindfulness meditation and self-reflection activity to help get you started. Mindfulness is about being in the present moment and paying attention to your life here and now. When we feel strongly about something and want to make a change or take action against something we feel isn't okay in our world, we need to be present and access the problem-solving, creative, compassionate parts of our brains. It's all right to feel passionate or even angry, but real change doesn't come when we are lost in our emotions and reacting. It can come when we decide intentionally and with an open heart and clear mind how we want to respond. The following meditation can help you get into that mindset. It is also a way to take care of yourself while you are doing the work to make a difference. So find a comfortable seat, close your eyes, place your hands on your belly and breathe slowly in and out through your nose. Notice your breath and your belly moving in and out. Now think about something you would like to help with or a change you want to see in the world, in your neighborhood, in your school, or wherever it is. And notice any feelings that come up. Maybe you are angry or sad or frustrated. Don't try to stop these feelings. Instead, name them in your mind. Now bring your attention back to your breath. Try to find a slow rhythm, breathing in and out. Imagining each breath filling your whole body. And as you breathe in, say to yourself, I am strong. As you breathe out, say, I am focused. And repeat this a few more times. I am strong. I am focused. I am strong. I am focused. Open your eyes and notice how you feel. Remember, no act is too small. You can be that pebble causing ripples that reach far and wide. You're the one. And that's how it starts. Each week, we take up a collection. We pass the plate to support the work of our church, whether we're online or in person. If you would like to give a contribution today, you have several options. You can send a check to Unitarian Church of Lincoln, 6300 A Street, Lincoln, Nebraska, 68510, and just write Sunday Plate in the memo line, if you will. If you have a Realm account, our online database, you can give there quite easily. I think the very easiest way, though, is if you give through text giving. All you do is text UC Lincoln and your amount to 73256. And the prompts that you get will walk you through the process from there. Thanks for considering giving a contribution today. I'm in the sanctuary of our church right now and recording this sermon on Friday afternoon. It's currently 2.24 p.m. Normally, we're not quite that explicit with the timestamps for sermons, but it's important this week because while 
the message of the church is the same regardless of what happens uh, with the election or with anything in the wider world. In this particular week, things may have changed between the time that I record this and the time that we are watching it together on Sunday morning. As of today, as of the moment that I'm recording this, there has been no call in the presidential race. Uh, votes are still being counted. They, it looks like they will be for some time. As of this morning, uh, both Georgia and Pennsylvania uh, had a majority of votes counted for uh, the candidate, candidacy of Vice President Biden, um, but neither of those states have been called either. So that's where we are situating you in time uh, as we begin this sermon. If things change radically between now and Sunday, uh, we'll likely record an additional piece to run either at the beginning of the worship service or at the end. But uh, if it continues on in the same, uh, the same vein that it has over the last couple of days, we'll just leave it with this uh, temporal location note uh, to begin with. I didn't get much sleep on Tuesday night. I used to love politics. The first TV show I remember really getting into, watching week after week, looking forward to it being on on Wednesday nights, was The West Wing. In college, my first internship was with State Representative Donna Lupardo, New York District 123 at the time writing what, in retrospect, were pretty badly reasoned issue briefs, and answering constituent phone calls. My undergraduate diploma has a political science degree on it. I am the son of a professor of public administration. Stacy and I met in a graduate government budgeting class. <coughs> and this week I didn't sleep much on Tuesday night. You know, there's a version of politics that's intrinsically boring. And that, strangely, uh, was the part that I fell in love with years ago, and still do. The politics that says that regulations on sewage treatment plants don't get a lot of attention, but they matter because the quality of the water our kids drink matters. The politics of constituent relations when a low-level staffer picks up the phone in a district office in upstate New York and says, Okay, Mrs. Jones, let's see what programs are out there for utility bill assistance for people on a fixed income. I miss the politics and policy of boring competency, a politics that's more concerned with outcome than ideology. And who knows, maybe that was all an illusion of privilege because it is unavoidable that the policy of boring competency has rarely been available for all. Mrs. Jones needed a sense of her own importance and an expectation that she would be heard in order to call her representative and demand help with her heating bill. Now, I didn't know it when I was 19, but there are plenty of folks in District 123 in New York who wouldn't know to make that call or who would see it as a futile exercise. Why would those folks in that office care about me? And when that trust breaks down even further, when nobody sees politics as the boring art of regulating communal life, that's when it falls apart. And on Tuesday night, it sure felt like it was falling apart. I started working in churches, I started preaching in 2015, when Donald Trump was first running for president. Then I have spent my whole ordained life as a minister preaching every Sunday in the shadow of this abomination of a federal administration. I never imagined before this started that I would have to get up on a Sunday morning to say that the government putting children in cages is wrong, or that I would need to tell the congregation I serve over and over that despite what the President of the United States says, there's still an active pandemic, and we're going to follow the best advice of the CDC, Nebraska Medical Center, and our local health department. 
I'm, I'm just not a radical. By natural inclination, I have about one apocalyptic sermon a decade in me. And that's just not the pace of the last four years. The word I've heard most this last week in talking to congregants, friends, family members is exhausted. We are all exhausted. I'm exhausted. And so on Tuesday night, when it looked likely that we would have four more years of this, I could, I could barely get up the energy to be angry. I'm just tired. Tired, but unable to sleep. Stacy and I finally were able to go to bed about 2.30 in the morning, just in time for our dog to vomit all over our bedroom half an hour later. By the time the sun rose on Wednesday morning, I wanted nothing to do so much as crawl back into bed, not, not record a daily update, not think about the sermon I had to write. And most I wanted to play with my daughter, but certainly, certainly not think about the last four years or the four years to come. So that's where I've been this week. And church, as we've been saying, is a place to be honest about that. Last week, we used a piece of a Victoria Safford reading that this is not a place for the cheerful, flimsy garden gate of everything is going to be all right, but a different, sometimes lonely place, that poem continues, a place of truth-telling about your own soul first and its condition, a place of resistance and of defiance, the piece of ground from which you see the world both as it is and as it could be. We're going to do joys and sorrows a little differently this week. As this next song plays, rather than simply typing a name, you can do that too. Take this as a time of truth-telling about your own soul first of all and its condition. If you're moved, type that in the chat or just take a few minutes to think back over the last few days, think about where you're at now. How is it with your soul, beloveds?
We Are a Gentle Angry People was written in a moment of despair and exhaustion. Holly Near wrote that song in the aftermath of Harvey Milk's assassination in San Francisco. It's a, it's a response to events in a political moment that seemed incomprehensible. In a moment of profound despair, it's a call that we are a gentle, angry people and we are singing, singing for our lives. And as exhausted as I might be, as tired as I might be, that's what I keep coming back to this week and for the last month. The stories of who we have been, the stories of the communities we've been a part of, the stories of love enduring in so many ways with so many people, even when it seemed impossible, even when it was exhausting. This is the 150th anniversary of universalism in Nebraska. And one of the stories we told as part of worship a few weeks ago was the story of the founding of this church, of the Universalist Society of Lincoln. In about 1869, Lincoln was just starting out, just founded as a new capital city for the new state of Nebraska. And around that time, a traveling Universalist evangelist came to town and preached some sermons in the construction site of the new state capitol building, convinced a group of a couple dozen liberal-minded folks to found a Universalist church. He helped raise the money for a chapel, and then he took all the money that he had raised from these couple dozen folks and absconded to San Francisco with the money. And then, over the next two years that followed, a woman named Mary Manell single-handedly, as near as we can tell, convinced all of those people that the message was more important than the money they lost. She appealed to the Universalist General Convention to take action on this fraud evangelist. They tried to get the money back from him, and when that proved impossible, she personally fundraised the money for the foundation of the Universalist Society of Lincoln. It would have been so easy for Mary Monell to throw up her hands to conclude that universalism was a scam that made people feel good about themselves and good about giving money. That all the talk of love and grace was a good way to get dollars from the gullible. That is not what happened. That's not the story of this place. The, the message of grace, of universal love, was compelling. And Mary Monell and her generation, that couple dozen people, founded a congregation that has endured for 150 years. So that's one story. Here's another. I came to Lincoln from Baltimore, where there's a, a story about the church in the 1960s. It's one of those stories that gets passed down from generation to generation of members of a church. I don't actually know exactly how it happened. I don't know what the sequence of events was, but I do know how it's remembered. The story goes that in the 1960s, the congregation was trying to decide whether to leave Baltimore, to move out of the city, out to the suburbs. This was the era of white flight in a lot of cities. Baltimore was no exception. And the story goes that in 1968, just before meeting, a meeting where they were going to discuss whether or not to leave Baltimore City, members gathered on the portico of the church, the porch overlooking Charles Street, and saw smoke rising in the West. Martin Luther King had just been killed, and the Baltimore uprising was underway an uprising that some parts of the city, even now, 60 years later, have not recovered from. And in that moment, it would have been so easy to move out to the suburbs, to say, this is too much, we can't do this. But in that moment, the congregation decided to commit to Baltimore be a part of the fabric of that beautiful, troubled city, and to proclaim love right on Charles Street, 10 blocks north of the harbor.
And the last story this morning is even more recent. This is a story from Lincoln, from right before I got here. So while I didn't go through it myself, a lot of the people watching this worship service did. About 10 years ago, the congregation started a wide-ranging process of preparing for the future, raising money, redoing your mission statement, renovating the building, relaunching the congregation for the next generation. And at the culminating year of that process, as the congregation was out of your building, as you renovated it, the interim minister who served here in that year behaved terribly. Justin Osterman verbally abused staff and lay leaders. He's since been removed from fellowship by the Unitarian Universalist Association. And in that moment, in 2015, it would have been so easy to throw up your hands and say, this work of being a community is a fool's game. If we put in all of this effort, all of this time, and talk about being the beloved community and still have to deal with this, then what's the point of it? But of course, that's not how the story went. The board decided not to extend Reverend Osterman's contract, and the congregation, I believe, is stronger than it has ever been. All of these stories. And you could tell more, each of you, everybody watching this, about a congregation during the Spanish flu, or Baltimore during World War II, or Unitarian Universalists opening their church as a sanctuary in downtown Louisville just, just weeks ago. Over and over and over again, people of faith have committed to the work of love and justice. Committed to the work of love in the world. Please join me in singing our next hymn, Rank by Rank, Again We Stand. Last week for All Souls Day, I preached on 1 Corinthians, and, and all week I've been posting daily updates with some variation on a theme from that passage. Love endures. But where there are prophecies, the Apostle Paul writes, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. 
but love never fails. And I think after, at the end of a week where I've rewritten this sermon four or five times, parts of it are from the beginning of the week, this last section I wrote this morning. That's where I've ended up. Love endures because love is the great motivating force in our lives. Different, different denominations have different gifts. Different faiths have different gifts. The Catholic Church has a magnificent edifice of theology that they have spent thousands of years building. The Methodists have some of the greatest music. Orthodox Judaism has a profound understanding of tradition and what that means. We universalists, we have love. Love is the great motivator of our faith because if, as the universalists preached way back 150 years ago, convincing Mary Monell that we are all beloved by the divine, then we are not compelled to act in the world because of fear. We do not fear eternal punishment. We are compelled to act out of love out of solidarity with each other and the divine, if, because if all human beings are beloved of God, if all human beings have inherent worth and dignity, then who are we to hate? And I think that's the thing. Through all those stories, that's the thing that Mary Minnell saw in 1870 when she said, we're going to build a universalist church in Lincoln, Nebraska. And it's what compelled folks in Baltimore in 1968 to say, we're going to stay here and be part of building the beloved community in this city. It's what held this congregation together in 2015, right when it felt like it was cracking, the end of a huge project. What compelled you to say, no, we're, we're going to stay and we're going to love each other. We're going to write a new covenant and we are going to be together as a church. So with all that history, who are we? Who am I to say otherwise? I couldn't sleep on Tuesday night worrying, as Wendell Berry puts it, what my life and my child's life will be. How can I have hope in a world where we are so divided, where so many people, some of whom I love, voted not for boring competence, for hatred and divisiveness. What do I tell Ailish when she gets old enough to ask about the time we elected a man who abuses women? How, how do I preach hope on Sunday? We're recording this on Friday. As I record this, there isn't a final call on Sunday, or there isn't a final call right now in the election. Maybe there will be by Sunday, maybe not. But I do have hope, not because of the election. You know, if, if Joe Biden is the next president, then, well, we've got a lot of work to do to so proclaim that Black Lives Matter. We've got a lot of work to do to mitigate climate change. And, you know, there's a whole global pandemic we're still in the midst of. That's not going to go away. That's still going to be hard. That's still going to be the project of the religious community to speak to. So the election doesn't Give me a ton of hope. What gives me hope is history. Mary Minnell, Baltimore in 68, this congregation in the last decade, hundreds of other stories. We just had time for three in this sermon. Who are we to break faith with that legacy of hope and love in the world? Who am I to get up this week and say anything other than love endures? I don't always know how. But somehow, if love has not won, the story is not over. So we're going to keep faith with our ancestors. We're going to preach love and justice because that is who we are. That's who we will be, whoever is in the White House. Where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, they will pass away. But love never fails. Love endures. And this is what I'll tell Elish. Hate will not win. Hate cannot win. 
because nothing is permanent. When all else drops away, love endures. Blessed be and amen. I'm recording this addendum to the sermon at about 5.30 in the afternoon on Friday. After I got home from the recording session at the church, I watched the um, news conference uh, from the mayor's office updating us on the, the progress the city is making or not making um, on mitigating the spread of COVID-19. The short version is this. Cases continue to rise in Lincoln. The health department has now moved the risk dial into the red or severe category. And they're asking us to, to take every possible precaution to slow this down. And while we haven't done this before, I, I do feel pretty strongly that Churches are a place to disseminate public health information. So I'm going to drop in a couple minutes of the, the mayor's um, remarks this afternoon, laying out what it means uh, for there to be a severe um, risk of spread in the community and, and what the city is asking of us. Good afternoon. And thank you for joining us for this community briefing. And thank you, Margie Prop, for providing interpretation today. As you can see, I am not at City Hall today. I wish I could say that's because today is my husband Scott's and my 21st wedding anniversary, and we're off celebrating. Unfortunately, we will be celebrating this anniversary from different floors of our home. I am fine, but my husband Scott just tested positive for COVID-19. And that means that we are now following the same health guidelines that we have shared with all of you over these past eight months. Because Scott is COVID positive, he is isolating in our basement, dealing with several typical recognizable symptoms like chills, a cough, and headache. No one else goes into the room where he is staying. Again, he's in isolation. Even though the kids and I do not have any symptoms, we are quarantining for 14 days because we live in the same household with him. In the absence of a vaccine for COVID-19, Scott's self-isolation and our 14-day quarantine at home is a key strategy for stopping the spread of the virus. By removing the opportunity to make physical contact with others until the infection is over, we stop the virus in its tracks and protect our extended family our friends and our neighbors. Stopping the virus in its tracks has been the focus of our local COVID-19 response throughout this pandemic. Today, we are asking everyone in our community to pay close attention so that all of us understand the sobering situation in which we find ourselves this week. Since we spoke with you at our last news conference, we received the remaining complete data for the week ending October 31st, as well as the data collected so far this week, the week ending November 7th. Our data indicates that there is now a severe risk of COVID-19 spread in Lincoln and Lancaster County, and therefore our risk dial is moving into the red. Director Lopez will provide more details in just a moment, but first, we wish to be crystal clear about what being in red means for our community. At this level of risk for COVID-19 spread, Lincoln and Lancaster County residents should take actions to minimize contact with others wherever possible and limit activities outside the home unless for work, school, medical care, and food. Residents should wear face masks, keep six feet of distance from others, avoid all gatherings with anyone outside of your home, and only visit businesses that follow public health guidance. For older adults, anyone with underlying health conditions and others at heightened risk from COVID-19, we urge you to stay home. Rely on help from others for needs outside the home, such as groceries and medications. Distance from those in your household who work outside the home and wear a face mask around other people. What being in red boils down to is that all of us must take decisive action to get the spread of COVID-19 under control. Collectively, we have the power to flatten the curve. We know this because we've come together as a community to do it before. 
Now is the time once again to flatten the curve. I know without even looking at the inside of my wedding ring where my anniversary date is inscribed that today is November 6th. The impact of the changes we begin making today to flatten the curve won't be discernible for another two to three weeks. So let's take the next 24 days, that's just over three weeks, and puts us at the last day of November. Let's take these next 24 days to dig deep and do what's right to protect one another and keep our healthcare system intact. Lives and livelihoods depend on all of us doing our part to move the needle back out of the red. With that, Director Lopez, over to you. Look, these are challenging times. This is, this is a big ask of each of us individually, of us as a community. I know it has been hard to be out of our building. I know it will continue to be hard. I know every person in this congregation has made sacrifices since we moved out of the building in March. And this is asking us to do more. But all that stuff in the sermon is true. Love endures, and we are not the first generation that's had a hard season. So we're going to keep doing it. We're going to stay doing everything that we can to keep each other safe. Because that's what love requires of us today. <laughs> stay safe, everybody. Keep your heads down. Keep masks on, avoid crowded spaces, and, uh, and we'll get through this. Uh, what is the next thing on our order of service? This is behind the scenes. I'm like trying to figure out where this, where this goes in our, in our worship service. So give me just a second here. Ah, yes. Love will guide us through all things, big and small, whether that's an election, whether that's a pandemic, whether that's getting by on a Thursday afternoon, love will always guide us. So will you please join in singing our closing hymn, come whatever happens over the next month, we will be guided by love. The hymn is Love Will Guide Us. Our time together this morning draws to an end. So go forth from this place or whatever place you're in, knowing that you are in a long line of folks who have proclaimed the enduring power of love in the world. Go in peace, go in kindness, go in joy, and go in faith. We'll see you in the daily updates and for worship next Sunday. Amen.